Yeah. 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 Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. It's been a while since we just had some fun looking at some extinct organisms. Well that time has come again. But before I get into that, I want to thank Random Evo Times for this fun fan art. Random Evo Times has a YouTube channel where you can find short form videos about various topics in biology. It's linked in the description, so check it out after you watch this video. Anyway, today we're going to take a look at extinct turtles and stem turtles. First I want to explain what a stem versus crown group is. A crown group is a kind of clade defined by living members. So crown birds could be defined as the common ancestor of the ostrich and pigeon and all of its descendants. By this very narrow definition, some extinct birds would not actually be birds, such as Ichthyornis. I should note though that this is not normally how birds would be defined. A stem group would be all the organisms more closely related to the crown group than to any other extant group. So by this definition, pterosaurs and non-avian dinosaurs could both count as stem birds, since they are more closely related to birds than any other extant group. Of course, a stem group is paraphyletic, because it excludes the crown group to which it is a stem, but since this is actually a part of the definition, and it's not a clade, it is still a useful distinction to make. The reason I'm going into this is that many of the animals we are about to see are not in fact turtles, that is, members of order Testudinus, Many of them are actually members of a larger group, such as Testudinata, which includes all the animals with true turtle shells, but not all of which were true crown turtles, as well as the even larger Pantestudinis, which is basically defined as all stem turtles plus crown turtles. First up on our list of shelly boys is an animal that, well, doesn't have a shell. Eunotosaurus was a basal reptile from the Capitanian stage of the Middle Permian that lived about 260 million years ago. If you saw this animal alive, you'd probably just call it a lizard and move on, but it had one important feature that it shares with modern turtles. Greatly broadened ribs. Its ribs would have made it very tough, and coupled with its probable burrowing lifestyle, Eunotosaurus was probably low on the list of prey items for any wandering Gorgonopsids. Because it is so relatively basal, both its relationship to turtles and the rest of reptiles is uncertain. It is possible it is actually a parareptile and not a true diapsid at all, although as we will see, if this is the case, then it probably was not a stem turtle in the first place. Now I want to talk about Papakelis. Assuming that Eunotosaurus is indeed a stem turtle, then Papakelis is even closer to crown turtles than Eunotosaurus, although in many ways they are similar animals. Papakelis lacks a shell, but what it does have are broadened and flattened ribs and gastralia. In case you didn't know, gastralia are dermal bones found on the ventral side of the torso. In modern animals, they are basically only found in tuataras and crocodilians, but they are present in the basalmost amniotes, including some synapsids, or mammal-like reptiles as they were once called. Turtles, on the other hand, have a plastron, the bottom shell. Based on the robust gastralia of Papokelis, it is quite possible that the plastron of turtles is in fact derived from gastralia. There is no evidence of Papokelis having been aquatic, and it may have burrowed like we have evidence for in Eunotosaurus. Papakelis is also very important because its skull is that of a diapsid. It has two sets of temporal fenestrae used for jaw muscle attachment. This fossil helps solidify the position of stem turtles within diapsida, along with lizards, sphenodons, birds, and crocodilians. Whether they are closer to lepidosaurs, such as lizards, snakes, and the tuatara, or to archosaurs like crocodiles and birds is still an open question, with the current consensus leaning strongly towards archosaur. This would make turtles archosauromorphs. Next up are Placocelis and Henotus, two turtle-like animals from about 30 million years after Eunotosaurus. Despite how they look, these guys aren't even turtles at all. These guys are Placodonts, which is a Permian group of Sauropterygians, which as we saw in the episode on Plesiosaurus, is the group to which those sea beasts belong. Placodonts converge with modern sea turtles in the superfamily Chelonoidea in a number of ways, evolving beaks, shells, and flipper-based locomotion. But their shells are quite different, often having two pairs of shells, an anterior pair and a posterior pair. Further, placodonts have very different skulls from turtles, so we can be quite sure that this is an example of convergence, because despite what Team Standing might say, convergence is easy to detect, except in very closely related lineages or extremely basal organisms. It is interesting to note, though, that most workers recover sauropterygians as stem turtles, but ones that diverge from the line leading to turtles before Eunotosaurus diverged so they are the most distantly related stem turtles to turtles. 
While this may make one think that perhaps this line had some predilection for growing shells, that orthogenetic idea is probably not true, and the shell condition is a convergent solution to similar or the same environmental pressures. Now we come to Odontocheles. Interestingly, Odontocheles only has a plastron, that is the bottom shell, and no carapace or upper shell, although it does have thick, broad ribs like Unotosaurus and Papocheles before it. It lived around 232 to 221 and a half million years ago, in what is now China during the Triassic period. Another interesting aspect of this animal is that it was at least semi-aquatic. It seems that the relationship between water and turtles goes back to nearly the beginning of the lineage. It seems like various turtle lineages have come and gone from the water. This aquatic setting for Odontocheles gives us a hint at the pressures that went into evolving the plastron, and later the carapace. It seems that, if we make the fairly safe assumption that the plastron was a defensive measure, that Odontocheles was being attacked by would-be predators from underneath. This is actually a fairly normal method of attack for ocean-going predators. Today, both orcas and sharks are famous for attacking seals this way, and are known to even leap out of the water when swimming up for a kill. Something similar was probably happening to Odontocheles, and the plastron helped it survive such attacks. Another thing to notice about this taxon is that it has teeth, unlike all modern turtles. It also almost certainly had a horny beak, at least on the anterior portion of the mouth. Living at around the same time as Odontocheles, we come to Eorhynchocheles, and here we see an apparent paradox. This stem turtle had a turtle-like beak and head, but no shell. This confuses things a bit, because if we base our ideas of the evolution of the plastron on Odontocheles, we would assume that teeth were lost after the initial formation of the plastron. Yet here we have the opposite condition. Really though, this is perhaps less of a problem than one might think initially. The evolution of a beak, which replaces teeth either completely or mostly, is not exactly unique. Beaks have evolved in teleost fish, synapsids, turtles, ornithischian dinosaurs, and more than once in theropod dinosaurs. It seems that beaks are relatively easy to evolve. On the other hand, we don't have any other evidence of lines of tetrapods, besides testudinata and the sauropterygians, ever evolving anything like a plastron so it is unlikely to have evolved more than those two times. For this reason, it is more likely that Eorhynchocheles was actually more basal than Odontocheles, but with a convergently evolved beak, than it is that it was closer to crown turtles than Odontocheles. Near the base of modern groups such as birds, turtles, and even humans, we can often see various lineages that look like they have what we would think of as a mosaic of more modern and more primitive features. For instance, there were some beaked Paravian dinosaurs that existed while the Paravians even closer to modern birds lacked a beak altogether. Also of note about Odontocheles is that it was also an ocean dweller, yet more evidence that turtles and their ancestors spent a lot of time in and near water right from the very beginning. We're going to more or less skip over the Jurassic, not because there weren't turtles at the time, as there clearly were, but because most of them aren't all that remarkable. Generally, the Jurassic saw a couple major things happen. As Pangaea broke up north to south, each side took the formerly united fauna and isolated them so that Africa, South America, Australia, India, and Antarctica stuck together, while North America and Eurasia did the same. On the south side of this divide, we find the Pleurodire turtles, which hide their head by tucking it sideways into the shell. These turtles, in the modern day, are by far the less common group, but they were more or less dominant in the southern hemisphere for tens of millions of years. On the north side, we have the Cryptodire turtles. These are the turtles you're probably most familiar with, and include terrapins, tortoises, sea turtles, snapping turtles, etc. This little bit of biogeography is one of the amazing ways that geology, biology, evolution, and ecology all combine to show the long and complex history of life on Earth. One last little bit is that a group of stem turtles, the Mayolanids, also emerged in Gondwana during the Mid-Jurassic. We will come back to them because they are big, have horns, and lasted longer than you might expect. Here we come to our viewer-requested turtle. This request comes from Edge on Twitter. Edge wanted me to include Senemis because it looks, quote, like a Gamera. Frankly, that's reason enough to include this animal. Senemis is a cryptodire turtle from the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous of China and Japan. We have some nine or so specimens, seven from China and two from Japan. One little complication is that some of the material that has been assigned to this taxon is probably not actually valid. In 2007, Igor Danilov and James Parham contested the identity of several fossils assigned to the taxon, and determined that they were in fact mixed remains of more than one genus of turtles, some of them being from the cryptodire genus Xinjiang Kelis. But aside from that controversy, we have a few specimens of a very cool-looking turtle. Its rear-facing spikes are, as far as I know, completely unique among turtles, but they do recall some of the armor of thyreophoran dinosaurs. Unfortunately, because it is hard to determine much of a turtle's behavior from just shells and skulls, which is most of what we have for this animal, we don't know that much. 
That being said, it does not seem hugely different aside from the obvious from many modern cryptodires. And so we can reasonably assume that it lived in rivers and ponds, feeding on small animals and eating plant matter. Turtles are great generalists, and it is likely that Cinemis was no exception. Of course, the exact purpose of the rearward-facing spikes is also not known, but when you're living in an environment full of alligators, crocodiles, and tyrannosaurs, having spikes seems like a decent defensive measure. On to the Cretaceous, by which time modern groups of turtles had evolved, although there were also some not-quite turtles hanging around along with groups of true turtles that did not make it to the present. First up for our Cretaceous turtles is Protostega. The largest living turtle is the leatherback sea turtle, and it is also the only member of its family. It can grow past 2 meters long and can weigh more than a golf cart. Protostega was about 50% longer, much wider, and probably weighed more than twice as much as the leatherback sea turtle. Protostega lived from about 100 million years ago until possibly the very end of the Cretaceous. It would have shared the world with the likes of Tyrannosaurus and Ankylosaurus, and it almost certainly had to deal with giant mosasaurs like Mosasaurus and Tylosaurus, which, by the way, were also not dinosaurs. Protostega is known from inland deposits in North America, meaning it swam the western interior seaway, which split the continent in two, leaving us with the well-studied Laramidia to the west, and the less well-known Appalachia on the east. While Protostega is related to modern sea turtles, it is from a line that diverged before the split between the two modern groups of sea turtles. Kelonidae and Dermochelidae, so it is not more closely related to one group or the other. However, this does mean that many of the aquatic adaptations it shares with the leatherback sea turtle or the green sea turtle are most likely due to shared ancestry and not convergence. As a side note, a green sea turtle once knocked me over, but it was a sneak attack from the rear, so it doesn't count. Next up, we have Archelon, and while Protostega may have had the family named after it, it is hard to argue that Archelon was not the true head of the family. Growing up to 4.5 meters, it is more than twice as long as a leatherback sea turtle, and it is fair to say it was basically a turtle the size of an elephant. Its temporal range overlaps with Protostega, with it existing from about 83 to 66 million years ago, and so it too would have had to deal with mosasaurs, dinosaurs, plesiosaurs, etc. But this titan probably didn't have to worry about too many natural predators once full grown. Based on similarities in the forelimb between Archelon and the loggerhead sea turtle, Archelon may in fact have been a predator of animals such as crustaceans and mollusks and it probably cruised over the bottom of the shallow sea looking for a meal to pick out, while being more or less impervious to attack. Now we come to our first and only Pleurodire turtle. It is the only turtle on this list that I know of to be featured in a video game. It's Carbonemis. You may have heard of this big fella if you have played the video game Ark Survival Evolved, which I play occasionally. The reconstruction in that game, like all the reconstructions in that game, is a bit, well, imaginative, shall we say. Carbonemis was a gigantic turtle with a shell coming in just under 1 and 3 quarters meters long. It shared its environment of a swampy Columbia some 60 million years ago with Titanoboa, the largest known snake. This was only some 6 million years after the asteroid impact that wiped out all the non-avian dinosaurs. But at least in this part of the world, reptiles were still among the dominant megafauna. In part, this was simply because most mammals were still small, burrowing, or arboreal insectivores. Indeed, this time period also saw the planocranid crocodiles, who were terrestrial pursuit predators that may have run on what amounts to hooves, and closer to Carbonemis, the four rassids or terror birds would remain the dominant land predators in South America until only 1.8 million years ago, meaning that the major tetrapod predators in the area were still mostly reptiles, including a turtle, a snake, various crocodilians such as the absolutely gigantic Purosaurus, and even dinosaurs in the form of the aforementioned terror birds. It's almost like the Mesozoic just didn't end in South America when it ended for most of the rest of the world. The final animal that I will be talking about today is Maolania. Maolania isn't actually a turtle at all, although it is a member of Testudinata, having a full turtle shell. This thing was like a real-life dreadnaw, with horns on its head and a spiky tail. It's sort of like what you'd get if you took an ankylosaurid and gave it an actual turtle shell. Interestingly enough, the only reason this guy isn't a turtle is because it went extinct just a bit too early to be extant when taxonomy was naming things and taxonomists were crossing oceans to catalog everything. Our earliest remains of Maolania are from only 2 million years ago, and it's possible that it was actually driven to extinction by humans shortly after they arrived in Australia, where these almost turtles lived. And of course, the place with club-tailed, horned almost turtles would be Australia, right? But this goes to show that the naming conventions of taxonomy are largely arbitrary. If Maolania had survived to modern times, it almost certainly would have been put in Testudinus as a sister group to the rest of the order. Nothing about the clades would have changed, only what we would call them now. 
you can see similar things in dinosaurs. Why aren't pterosaurs dinosaurs? No reason but that they were excluded from the definition when the definition of dinosauria was created. No matter what humans call a certain group, whether it be dinosauria, mammalia, or testudinous, the underlying shape of the cladogram or phylogenetic tree will remain the same. Taxa are mostly arbitrary and are man-made. The clades are what is real and what is actually important in the real world. So what do we know about these things that are almost turtles? Well, they seem to have been beachcombers, but were not aquatic. They were herbivores, and they might have swum occasionally to get some food underwater, but they were not highly adapted for swimming. The horns would have prevented these animals from fully retracting their heads, but it is not known what they were for. Perhaps they were defensive, or maybe they were display structures, or perhaps they were used in intraspecific combat, such as over mates or territory. Unfortunately, that's about all I could find, except that there was a related species in the same family that has been named Ninja Mace. And yes, it was explicitly named for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It's from Queensland, Australia, and I want to thank Jackson Wheat for alerting me to its existence. Well, that's it for the notable extinct turtles and stem turtles I want to cover. Of course, these examples were standouts among the group, either because of their basal morphology, great size, or simply for being weird things with horns and tail spikes. Throughout most of the Mesozoic and Cenozoic, most turtles were exactly what you'd expect. Smallish river or ocean-dwelling species of mostly omnivores feeding on small fish, worms, plants, etc., with some terrestrial species thrown in the mix. Indeed, if you saw the Jurassic Cryptodire turtle Solnhofia today, Nothing about it would make it stand out from any other European terrapin. It turns out that turtles have been turtling for a long time, and after they got good at it, they stayed good at it, and remain good at it today. Indeed, as a group, turtles are in no current danger of extinction, although that varies by species, with all sea turtles being at least threatened. On the other side of the coin, the common snapping turtle is in fact thriving and spreading into areas it was not known to inhabit before, such as parts of the Midwest United States, like Utah, where they are considered pests. Turtles are a unique branch of the tree of life, and I hope you learned about some of their notable ancestors, members, and cousins today. If you liked this video, don't forget to share it and hit the like button. Leave a comment to tell me what you think, and if you're not already subscribed, please do hit the subscribe button and the bell so that you're really subscribed. I'm the Dapper Dino. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I'd like to take a minute to say thank you to my patrons and channel members on YouTube. They help me make this channel possible, and without them, I couldn't keep going. Specifically, I want to thank my $20 and above patrons, Ben Tovind, Ian Chen, Sphincter of Doom, Chris Love, Henry Hutanen, and Bob Knob. If you'd like to join the channel or become a patron, links are in the description, and if that's not right for you, but you want some other way to help out, there's also an Amazon wishlist, as well as a Teespring store where you can get Dapper Dino merchandise. If none of that works for you, just liking and sharing this video really helps out. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Well, you first, 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 how would you tell it? You first, 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 how would you tell it? Well, you first, 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 I don't know. I don't know.